So in the last um, few lectures, we have talked about uh, chemical reactions. And we, uh, we've uh, given a lot of detailed information about how chemical reactions work. Um, but if we think about how they are used in communication systems and molecular communication systems, it helps to think back to the block diagram model of a communication system. So we have our transmitter, channel, and our receiver. Um, how are chemical reactions used? So we talked a little bit about this. At the transmitter, the uh, chemical reactions can be used to produce molecules that are um, uh, that can then be released. In other words, it produces the signal bearing molecules and it can be involved in the process of releasing those molecules. At the receiver, um, chemical reactions can be used um, to pull the signal bearing molecules out of the environment and uh, can do things like taking action based on whatever signal was received. Um, in the channel, chemical reactions are not so important. I'm not gonna say that they are unimportant, but they are less, they're not the most important um, uh, physical phenomenon happening in the channel. So we have reactions here. reactions here, what's going on in the channel? So in the channel, we have molecules released from the transmitter and they're supposed to propagate to the receiver. If we think about um, uh, traditional wireless communications from the transmitter to the receiver, we have uh, electromagnetic waves propagating in free space. But now, uh, excuse me, and we know that uh, we know the physical phenomenon by which those, uh, those uh, electromagnetic waves propagate, uh, it's given by the wave equation, and Maxwell's equations. But in this instance, we are releasing particles, we're releasing uh, molecules from the transmitter. And those molecules are supposed to propagate through this environment to the receiver. Now in any non, uh, you know, uh, gaseous, in any gaseous or liquid environment, um, the method of propagation of a molecule from one point to another is by a process called diffusion. So in this lecture and the next lecture, we're gonna talk about the physics of diffusion. What we're gonna see is that um, diffusion has a huge impact on molecular communication systems. It's uh, again, uh, aside from reactions, it's the most important thing to model uh, and to understand. And it will contribute significantly to the noise processes, particularly because it is uh, a process in the channel. We're gonna look at two kinds of um, diffusion. One is I'm going to call it microscale. Diffusion, and by that I mean diffusion where individual molecules are significant. So in other words, if, um, if you're looking at a system where the scale of the system is such that individual molecules can be resolved and look and are, uh, are important as far as modeling the system, then we're gonna call that micro scale diffusion. And at this scale, what we talk about is Brownian motion. And mathematically, we call it the Wiener process. Alternatively, what I'm going to call macro scale diffusion. In this instance, uh, individual molecules can't be resolved. And at that scale, what we're talking about is um, things like the diffusion equation 
sorry, actually the diffusion equation, there's a better term for it, it's called Fick's law. And we're, the quantity that we're dealing with is concentration. So up here in microscale, what's going on is we're looking at the trajectories of individual molecules. At macro scale, we're looking at in the aggregate, the concentration of molecules and they're propagating by Dick's law. So what we're gonna do over the next two lectures, this lecture, we're gonna talk mostly about micro scale diffusion. And in the next lecture, we're gonna talk mostly about macro scale diffusion. So in microscale diffusion, the trajectories of individual molecules can be resolved. So what I'm gonna do, um, most of my examples will have to do with one dimensional diffusion, but they're easily generalizable to multi-dimensional diffusion. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define a, the a particle. Um, that has a position at each time. So my time variable is gonna be T and the position, I'm gonna call this B of T. B here refers to the fact that it's a Brownian motion. Um, B of T, if B of T is a Brownian motion, then physically it is governed by random collisions. with other molecules in the environment. Um, so this is where Brownian motion comes from. A, science, a scientist named Brown observed, uh, I think it was pollen through a microscope. And basically what he saw was that the pollen particle basically did this, it jumped, it jumped around. So he couldn't see this, but he, um, I, I'm not sure if it was him or if it was someone later who deduced that the reason for these, uh, these jumps, these random uh, motions was that water molecules, which he could not see with his microscope were constantly, were constantly hitting, um, were constantly hitting this particle in a random way and causing it to jump uh, from side to side and to do a random walk. We model Brownian motion, B of T, as a Wiener process. So B of T is a random process. This model is given by uh, the Wiener process. The Wiener process uh, has two, has two uh, criteria. So B of T has two properties. First, for times T1 and T2, the increment in B from B1 to, from T1 to T2, which I'm gonna call this B of T2 minus B of T1, 
this is a random variable. I mean, uh, each of these positions is random at, at T2 and T1. The difference between them is going to be a Gaussian random variable. So N means this is the Gaussian distribution with mean zero and some variance sigma squared times T2 minus T1. So notice that variance is proportional to the difference in time. with the cost of proportionality being sigma squared. We'll talk a little bit about sigma squared in a minute. Uh, it, has a, it has a nice physical uh, meaning, but we'll just leave that for now. Second property of um, a Brownian motion described by the Wiener process is that for two, for disjoint intervals, Uh, the increments are independent. So if you imagine a timeline and you have two disjoint intervals, let's call them T1, T2, T1 prime, T2 prime, Brownian mo the, the Brownian motion increment from T2 to T1 and the Brownian motion increment from T2 prime to T1 prime these are independent as long as these um, these time spans are independent now if they overlap let's say T1 came over here and was less than T2, then they're no longer independent. But as long as these time increments are independent, or excuse me, these time spans uh, are uh, don't overlap, then these increments are independent of each other. So one thing that that implies, if we take both these properties together, together, these properties imply that if we took a Brownian I put examples of the Brownian motion at regular intervals, the increments would be IID. To see that, um, let's make the, let's make, um, or excuse me, let's sample our Brownian motion at integer time instance. So the increment here is B1 minus B0. The increment here is B2 minus B1, so on. Uh, actually, let me keep writing some of those. Increment here, B3 minus B2. Increment here, four minus B3. So you'll get the idea pretty quick, I think. So if we look here by my property on the last page, um, the increment is the, the normal distribution of mean zero and variance sigma squared times the difference in times. So one minus zero is one. So I get normal zero sigma squared. This is distributed again, the difference between two and one is one. So that's normal zero sigma squared and so on. And by the second property, uh, 
uh, the increments are independent. So that leads to something interesting, which is what I'm going to call the Markov property. Brownian motion. So if you know, If you know um, a sequence of Brownian motions, or excuse me, of, of points of a Brownian motion, it's called T1, T2, T3, and so on. We call this Tn. So in other words, you have a Brownian motion and you sample it at many points. They don't have to be uh, regular, just as long as they're different. And without loss of generality, we're gonna say, T1 is less than T2, is less than T3, and so on, up to Tn. Um, you might think, okay, gee, we know all these points of the Brownian motion, and what I want to know now is given all of the evidence of the past, actually it will be convenient for me to include Tn minus one here, Given all the evidence I have of where this Brownian motion came from, what can I say about the last points? In other words, I'm looking for the, pro the probability or the probability density function rather of B a Tn. So this is what I'm interested in, given all the points in the past. So B Tn minus one and so on down to BT2, BT1. So in order to get this, what we need to know, we already know by assumption here, B of T n minus one. But from that, how do we get BTN? Well, I mean, trivially we can write B of Tn is equal to B of Tn minus B of Tn minus one plus B of Tn minus one. So I, I mean, on the right-hand side, I just subtracted uh, and added by B of Tn minus one. But writing this a different way, that is the increment from Tn minus one to Tn. And that by the second property is independent of any past interval. So in other words, if you look up here, all these time units are in the past. Let me just uh, add this here. None of these time instants will overlap with this interval between Tn minus one and Tn. So these will all be independent of everything that happened before. So if I know what T, Tn minus B of Tn minus one is, as I do here, none of the other stuff matters. So from this, um, from this argument, we can say, F of B, Tn given B Tn minus one and so on down to B T one is equal to F of B Tn given B Tn minus one. This implies the Brownian motion is a Markov process. In other words, it only depends on the past. 
through the present or the future only depends on the past through the present. And I can know everything about what happened to this Brownian motion before now, and it doesn't matter because the next increment is independent. And that's, that's basically a Markov chain. That's great because that simplifies the analysis kind of a lot. And it also makes these processes relatively easy to simulate. Um, I'm just gonna make one mark and then we'll talk a little more about simulation. So we can talk about Brownian motion with drift. So it's still a Wiener process, but it's a Wiener process with drift. And basically what happens is everything is the same Still Markov. But the increments are distributed as follows. Now, if you think about it, what we had before, I'm going to write what we had before and then I'm going to erase it. So just fair warning. This is distributed. This is what we had before. It was mean zero and variance sigma squared t2 minus t1. If you think about what uh, drift means, that means every time, um, every time, uh, as time moves on, there's a certain deterministic component. So in other words, if this is a Brownian motion, imagine the mouse cursor as a random Brownian motion, a Brownian motion with drift will have some bias to it. As you can see, in, in my second example, the most cur the uh, the pointer cursor was moving randomly but biased in a certain direction. Uh, and that'll show up in the mean here. So what's going to happen is that if you have drift with velocity v, then on average, the, the center of the distribution, if you like, is going to move by V times T2 minus T1 every time instant. So that's the distance. This becomes the distance of the drift, the average distance traveled by the drift over this time interval. And that's gonna show up here. So let me erase that and correct it. So everything's the same, it's still Markov, except B T2 minus T1 is now distributed with a, with a mean, with a shifting mean. So drift implies a shifting mean. Another fun thing about the Wiener process, whether with drift or with, without drift is that um, it's relatively easy to simulate. And the Markov property um, makes the Wiener process easy to simulate. So again, you can pick whatever time base you want, but if we just go with an integer time base and we want to generate B0 or we want to simulate B0, B1, B2, and so on, remember our argument going from here to here, it's just a uh, Gaussian random variable with mean zero and variance sigma squared going from here to here. It's a Gaussian random variable of mean zero, variance sigma squared, and so on. So basically, each time instant you can add the increment.
if you have drift, so this is without drift. If you have drift, of course, the increment is just given by V, uh, excuse me, in this instance, it's V T2 minus T1, but T2 minus T1 is one. So in this instance, it would be N and V sigma squared. This is with drift. If you want an arbitrary, um, if you want an arbitrary uh, time increment, so for instance, B of zero, B of delta T, or uh, an arbitrary sampling interval, excuse me, two delta T and so on, the increments now become, if you go back, you can see this, but um, we scale the increments uh, variance and mean by delta T. So this would be V delta T, sigma squared delta T. I am going to upload, along with these notes, I'm gonna upload uh, Jupyter Notebook. containing sample simulations. If you don't run Jupyter Notebook, that's fine. Um, you can instead do this on Google Colab, which is free. Just write that here. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Google Colab already, but basically what you do is you just upload, um, you upload the notebook that I have uh, that I'm that I'm putting with these notes, and you can simply run it in Google's environment, and you're running it on Google servers with all the right packages, so it should be should be straightforward. Okay, so now we can model um, the Brownian motion of an individual molecule. Let me just add one more point here. Um, we need to specify sigma squared. So what is sigma squared? So for a one dimensional Brownian motion, Uh, sigma squared is actually equal to two times D. Uh, okay, so this is, I mean, let me let me be a little more clear here for a one dimensional. Brownian motion, sigma squared is two times D. Where D is the diffusion coefficient The diffusion coefficient has to do with both um, the medium, uh, in other words, the medium that the particle is propagating through and the properties of the molecule that's propagating itself. There's actually a formula for this. It is D equals KBT divided by six pi eta RH where KB is Boltzmann's constant. Um, T is the temperature. Eta is the viscosity. And RH is the hydraulic radius. Uh, viscosity of the medium and RH is the hydraulic radius of the particle. So as you can see, uh, D is dependent on both the medium and the particle. And if uh, for biomolecules, um, D will be I mean, this is an extremely rough guideline and this will not always be followed, but it should probably be in the range of one to 10. And it's the, the units here would be micrometers squared per second. 